Okay, we're going to recap PFL number four as part of the 2022 regular season, which just happened on Friday the 17th of June. A pretty good overall event. There were 10 bouts in total. The main event was Alex Martinez versus Clay Collard. That one did not go our way. We were on Clay Collard, as were a lot of people. He was a significant favorite, like a two to one favorite, and he lost by a split decision. We're going to go over that fight, each fight, very quickly, one fight at a time, and then also give you our negative betting results. We have been on a unfortunate cold streak here. It's been rough recently but we do not hide from our shallow results. We publish everything on betmma.tips. Following our profile is free. All of our betting information is free. Unfortunately, we have uh, just been coming up short on all these recent cards, and Clay Collard was another example of that. Let's start off with the main event, and then we'll work our way back down. So in the main event, Clay Collard versus Alex Martinez, both guys had moments. It was a three-round fight, because again, it's part of a regular season. It's not a five-round fight. It came down to round two. Round two was a round where he knocks down Martinez, but then Martinez gets him into like a choke, and it looked nasty. It did look bad. I'm not going to lie. And so the judges in round two basically gave round two to Martinez, or at least the one judge or two judges, I'm sorry, who gave the fight to Martinez, gave round two to Martinez because they felt that even though Clay Collard had knocked down Martinez in the round, that Martinez submission attempts and some control time on the ground were enough to win the round. Recently, we've saw some fights where the control time was not rewarded. Here you have a fight where Clay Collard knocks down a guy in a round and the guy try some submissions doesn't get them obviously he defends them unfortunately he still loses the round so it goes by a split decision it's a rough one because we had clay hollard moving down to the co-main event antonio carlos jr versus bruce soto by unanimous decision carlos jr wins the fight it was a good showing for soto most people thought carlos jr would just run through him and submit him it shows you that look jr is a good fighter but that minus what 800 minus 1000 money line was a little bit off we had jr to win the fight we didn't bet on him at all but he gets to win there moving down to mercier versus roush monfio mercier gets a decision win we had him to win the fight Fight. It was just about a pick up on the money line. Roush Monfio, who had a winning streak going with tons of wins as a slight dog, finally gets himself a loss. OAM just looks really good right now. It looks like it's his time with Roush Monfio. You know, he had his time last year. He won the PFLs. Moving down to Jeremy Stevens versus Miles Price. Woo! This was a sweat here because we did have Jeremy Stevens in one or two small parlays, which was not a good idea, actually, looking back. He was like a minus 500 favorite when we got him in our parlays. He finished, I believe, closed at around minus 700. So it just got very chalky. And having watched the fight, I watched it kind of in passing. I didn't watch it in detail, but I was watching it live on another screen, and it was super duper close. No question about it. Miles Price had an argument to have won the fight. And Jeremy Stevens, man, it just did not look very good. Did enough to win the fight. Thank God we had him in a few small bets we'll talk about. But uh, by the skin of his uh, his back there, he barely got it. Now, moving down to Amari Akhmedov versus Theodorus Akstolis. Man, I have a buddy of mine over at Never Hedge Media, Kyle Miller over there. He puts out a PFL note sheet. He also puts out PFL bets every week. It's totally free at Never Hedge Media. Please follow that guy. He's very smart. He had Amari Akhmedov by submission. Tons of plus money on that prop. He explained it in his breakdown. He explained why the value was there and why it was being overlooked. And lo and behold, Amari Akhmedov, round two. It's a triangle choke win over Teodoros Oxtolas. For Oxtolas, man, he just does not look like he belongs at this level. A guy who once knocked out Bruno Capeloza just doesn't look like he's at this level. For Omari Akhmedov, he looked good. He looked good. My only question would be, it's like, how bad is Teodoros? But for Omari Akhmedov, he's blazing into the playoffs, has now two finishes in back-to-back -back regular season fights. Moving down to Natan Schultz versus Marcin Held. We had this fight wrong. We had chose Marcin Held to win this fight. It was just about to pick him. Natan Schultz looked pretty good. What I like most about him here is he pushed forward tempo, and he won the fight, of course, by decision. You can imagine these guys had fought before. It went to like a close decision before. It happens again. Natan Schultz, though, was the unanimous decision winner, and he was a rightful winner in this fight. Moving we'll down to the fight of the night for us in terms of our dog picks. We had Delon Monte to win the fight, and not because we feel like he's an amazing fighter. It was that Sorty looked so poor in his prior fight before this that it was like hard to not have recency bias against him. And lo and behold, he loses by a knockout in round one. Delon Monte looked pretty good. I'm going to say again, I'm going to repeat myself, Sorty just doesn't look very good. So the plus money was there for Monte. We did bet on him. There was a nice return. And we talked about that in our breakdown show. If you listen to our breakdown show on this, we talked specifically about it again. It wasn't that we loved Delon Monte. We didn't see much from him in his debut. He got submitted very quickly against Carlos Jr. But having seen what we saw recently from Sorty, Sorty looks like a guy who's got a ton of wear and tear on the tires and a guy who's just like sort of phasing out now and uh, just did not look very good at all. So anyway, moving on down to Rob Wilkinson versus Victor. 
Victor Pasta. We love Wilkinson, but so did everyone. It made perfect sense. He gets a win round one via KO over Victor Pasta. And for Pasta, you know, he got knocked out two months ago before this. People were talking about it like maybe it's too soon to come back. Gets knocked out again. Yeah, he needs to take a break. I think he'll be eliminated from the playoffs anyway, so it's over for him. He looks very chinny, put it that way. And Rob Wilkinson looking very good, getting some finishes. You know, dare I say, peak version of Rob Wilkinson. We'll see what happens in the playoffs, but he looked very good here. And we had him in some parlays. This may have been one of the most solid picks in the entire card. A guy with UFC level experience scoring off a guy in Victor Pesta who's like, ugh, shaky. All right, moving down to Josh Silvera versus Martin Hamlet. Man, I wish every single prediction and every breakdown can go the way of this kind of fight. It was so obvious to me and pretty much anyone else breaking down fights. You watch film on Silvera. He was undefeated at 8-0, going up against a guy in Martin Hamlet, who Martin Hamlet is a very solid overall mixed martial artist, but underlining the word solid, like not excellent, not amazing, doesn't do anything that's gonna like blow your mind away, has some decent top control, can make someone look bad, can make a fight very boring, and in his prior fight, he did that. But coming into this fight, some obvious pointers were, number one, Josh Silvera was like the younger, more ambitious fighter coming in here with more even to prove at 8-0. Going against a guy like Martin Hamlet, who's been around the block, tends to slow down in fights. Silvera came in here, displayed his athleticism. He bullied Martin Hamlet and got a finish via a KO in round one. Swept the floor with Martin Hamlet. And Hamlet, I'm sorry to say it, but like this is like the ceiling for him. He's not going to beat young whippersnappers like Josh Silvera, who are more athletic, better submission ability, can punch hard as fuck. And for Martin Hamlet, this is the ceiling again. He belongs in the PFL will have a very hard time getting a PFL championship when there's guys like Silvera around. For Silvera, he sat at like minus 180, minus 150 on some books. A huge value here. We were all over him. My only regret is we just didn't put a little more behind this bet because he was solid, looked great, round one finish. And the first fight of the night was Nate Jennerman versus Jake Childress. We did not break down this fight because Nate Jennerman was supposed to fight someone else. I think Bruno, one of the Brazilians down there, uh, Miranda, right? And Miranda ended up backing out. Not sure what happened. But in any case, Nate Jennerman gets a win round to by submission and that was your overall results for pfl number four now from a betting standpoint how did we do not great we finished at negative 0.7 units the silver lining is that we only lost 70 total dollars 0.7 units now our straight picks were clay collard at one unit at minus 170 so we lost that outright 100 bucks out the window we had joshua silvera to beat martin hamlet at minus 140 for only one unit we needed to strap up our balls there, have some more cojones, and lay down like a two or three unit bet there. And looking back on it, that was one of my biggest regrets on this card. So we win $71 on that bet. Now moving down to our parlays. Parlay number one, we had Collard to win, fail. Akhmedov to win, Wilkinson to win, and Silvera to win. That was a four-leg parlay, 25 bucks at plus 329 odds. And yes, the card loss cost us. 25 bucks, not a big deal, but it cost us the potential to win that parlay. Now, next parlay did not go so well. We had Collard to win. We had Qatar to win for UFC Fight Night. Dacus to win UFC Fight Night. So all three of those part of the legs are part of the parlay. Shit out the window. The one leg we did get right was Akhmedov to win. And that was a $50 wager at plus 289 odds. So again, a loss. Next parlay was a two-legger. I thought it was safe. Silvera to win and Collard to win. I'm like, that's safe, right? Collard's going to win the fight. No. Collard loses by split decision. A $50 wager again out the window. And the one parlay we actually did hit here was Stevens to win at minus 550 and Silvera to win at minus 180. And again, that Stevens fight was a sweat. Watching that now back later on. Probably not a good bet. We put one unit there to win 84 bucks. And so that was our results. We ended up with negative 0.41 return on our props and parlays and negative 0.29 on our straight bets for a negative total of 0.7 units or $70 in total losses. So yeah, a bit of a rough overall uh, night there for PFL number four. A card that now looking back on, I could have been more aggressive in a few spots, had a great read overall. And as for the collared fight, if I can get on my soapbox for one second, I really thought he won the fight. I was doing a live stream with Dave and Ranj over at uh, Capra Comparison Picks. And during our live stream, we had a chance at the end to actually watch the fight together and you know do like a watch party and Dave, who's had no skin in the game, said very clearly at the end of the fight when it was over that, you know what, I, I don't have any bets, but uh, it seems to me like Collard clearly won the fight. And I had confidence, too. I thought he won the fight. He did not. <laughs> so that is the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, looking back, I think Collard maybe could have done a little better in round two when he knocks down Martinez, maybe not to rush and get in, ends up getting sloppy, ends up giving up like a takedown position control, whereas he could have been a little more managing of distance. He had a clear up in that round at that point. And so from that standpoint, I guess there was some room for improvement for Martinez. Good for him. Betting standpoint, poor for us. We look to break our cold streak moving into PFL number five next week.